Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. Today, we're going to learn about the 2019 movie simply called Radioactive. Directed by Majan Satrapi, Radioactive tells the story of Marie Curie, also known as Madame Curie. The storyline of the movie starts with Marie's early career. We see her meeting, working with, and eventually marrying Pierre Curie. Together, the couple wins a Nobel Prize in physics. And after his tragic death, Marie goes on to win another Nobel Prize in chemistry, becoming the first woman to win a Nobel Prize, as well as the first person to win two Nobel Prizes at all. How much of what we saw in the movie really happened? Today, we'll be chatting with Lauren Redness, who is the artist and author behind the visual biography that the movie is based on. That book is called Radioactive, Marie and Pierre Curie, A Tale of Love and Fallout. Before we bring Lauren on the line, though, it's time to set up our game, Two Truths and a Lie. Now, if you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true, and that means one of them is an all-out lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, Pierre made it clear that Marie's work should be recognized by the Nobel Prize Committee. Number two, radium was marketed in everything from toothpaste to cures for baldness. Number three, Marie immediately knew how dangerous it was, so she didn't actually keep any radium at home. Got them? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to identify which one is the lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to connect with Lauren Redness about the historical accuracy of radioactive. We'll get into some of the details in the movie, but if we take a step back and look at the movie kind of from an overall perspective, if you were to give it a letter grade for historical accuracy, what would you say it would get? That's such an interesting question because, of course, the movie is about real people and real events. At the same time, it's not a documentary and it doesn't purport to be, I don't want to say it doesn't purport to be accurate, but it is clearly interpretive, right? right? And it has certain ways of flagging that with even by imagining conversations or emotions that could not have been or weren't historically recorded. So I guess I'm hedging and not giving <laughs> a specific grade uh, because I'm not sure that historical accuracy is the terms that the movie wants to be evaluated on. That's a, that's a very fair point. And I mean, yeah, it definitely happens where we don't know what the conversations were. And so um, I know for a lot of movies, uh, it's where we know that this happened and we know that this happened, but we don't know what connected in between or the conversations that happened to connect those. And so you have to have some of that creative freedom to be able to fill in some of those gaps if you want to be able to show some of those conversations. Yeah, exactly. And I think, I mean, one of the reasons that I was drawn to write the book about the Curies is because there is a lot of historical information available. There are a lot of letters, journals, diaries, books that Marie and Pierre did write, many, many published, um, you know, published papers and essays. So we have a lot to work with, which establishes um, a very detailed historical record. But then it also, I think, allows for these artistic interpretations, because if someone really wants, you know, the kind of straight up historical record, they could go turn to those primary sources. But here also we get the opportunity to speculate, as you imply, by, you know, filling in those gaps. Yes. And it helps kind of make them feel more, you get to connect with them a lot more on a personal level. And you know, when you go through some of those conversations, I think definitely. Now, near the beginning of the movie, we are introduced to Marie in 1893 and we see her meeting Pierre Curie, but we'll come back to that in a minute because we find out through some of the dialogue there in the beginning um, with her sister, Ronia, that she goes by Marie now that she's in Paris, but her name used to be Maria Sklodowska. Can you share some historical context around what led Marie to move from Poland to Paris before the timeline of the movie even began? Sure. So, um, right, Maria Sklodowska was born in Poland under Russian occupation. 
And her mother and her sister both died, one of her sisters died of tuberculosis before she was 11 years old. She went to, you know, as a, as a teenager, went off to the countryside to work as a governess for a wealthy family. And um, she was always academically inclined and always very interested in science. You know, she's, there are stories about her kind of early brilliance where she taught herself to read apparently at the age of four and, um, you know, other, other kind of academic or intellectual exploits. But um, when she was, um, when she was working as a governess, she and Branya, the sister that you mentioned, made a pact because in order to get an education out from under the thumb of the Russian occupiers and to, um, and as girls to have the freedom to get a higher education, they would have to leave Poland. So mm. they made an agreement that Maria would work to fund Branya's immigration to Paris and then Branya would establish herself in Paris and work to get Maria to be able to also move and to enroll at the Sorbonne. Oh, wow. Okay. And that explains something that I guess, I mean, we see it in the movie, but it doesn't, since it doesn't show a lot of that beginning, they do really seem to have a very close connection as sisters and maybe even closer than some. I mean, if they're working together like this to even move to a completely different country for a new life together. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're a very close family. She seemed to have really, really good relationships with everyone in her her family. Oh, if we go back to the movie, um, it was in 1893 when Marie and Pierre run into each other and we see it happening quite literally in the film. They actually bump into each other on the street. Marie drops one of her books and then Pierre notices that it's something about microbiology and that piques his interest. At first, Marie rushes away. She doesn't really seem interested in in him, but then a little later, the two strike up a conversation. How well did the movie do showing how Pierre and Marie met? Well, that is a fictional meet cute that the movie invents. It, I mean, it was a meet cute, that is for sure. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, in fact, what happened was they were introduced by a mutual friend, a Polish scientist. And um, so they the movie kind of uh, separates and conflates different historical moments there. So um, they have part about Marie looking for a new laboratory space and actually it was because she was looking for a new laboratory space that she was introduced to Pierre Curie who then invited her to come share a space in his lab um, but it was not a, a street encounter like we see in the movie <laughs> literally bumping into into each other and she I thought that yeah. might have been a little <laughs> too convenient for <laughs> for reality it's microbiology it happens, but not always <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned that. And in the movie, we do see uh, Marie losing her lab space at the university in Paris. And the way the movie kind of portrays this is it seems that people don't really seem to be taking her very seriously there at the university. They, they kind of move her equipment around in the middle of the night for their own work, which then, of course, affects her ability to work. And then when she complains about it, the guy in charge is the man in the movie named uh, Professor Lippmann. He just kicks her out of the lab completely. And since Marie is both Polish and a woman working in a male-dominated scientific field in France, she just simply doesn't seem to get a lot of respect from her peers. Is that a good example of some of the challenges that Marie faced as a woman working in science in the late 1800s? Right. Yeah, I think um, yes and no. So I guess I'll say it this way. No doubt she faced innumerable challenges as a foreigner and as a woman. I mean, clearly. But I don't think there's any historical evidence that Gabriel Lippmann per se was hostile to her the way he is portrayed in the movie. Um, That anecdote is kind of used as a proxy for challenges she must have faced, but um, isn't specifically documented as like what actually happened. I think she felt squeezed in that laboratory space. So she was seeking out other space. I don't think he kicked her out. Um, I think that, you know, back Pierre himself as a white French man, so not, you know, in any of the demographics that were challenging to, or, you know, caused Marie to have additional obstacles in her path. He also faced a lot of um, kind of just from the establishment and he wasn't particularly um, supported and he didn't have a good lab. He didn't have a professorship at that time. So I think there were challenges abounding 
it wasn't it wasn't only that she was you know polish and a woman okay okay Although, that, that's yeah, very... certainly i'm sure that was added added to it but yeah yeah you mentioned some of the do we know like maybe an example of one of the challenges that she might have faced um that might have been different than something that pierre might have faced since she was and one of the impressions i got kind of from the movie was not only because she was a woman but because she was not French, even though she changed her name to Marie, it seems to kind of almost fit in. I got the impression that she was trying to seem more French to, uh, to, to fit in a little bit more. Well, I mean, there are a number of specific examples that we can point to when, um, and the movie does a, a s- attempt to illustrate this, I think, um, when they were awarded the Nobel Prize, in fact, that was awarded to Pierre, and he did have mm. to write a letter and say, no, this was our work together, and really, really insist that it wasn't just um, in his name. And partly note that she was one of 23 women in a class of 1800. So, you know, there are very few women. And w- even once the couple was married, and even once they were quite established, she was still carrying the burden of taking care of the children, rushing home to make lunch. So she still had, you know, a lot of the kind of traditional gender roles to juggle that, you know, Pierre, who, you know, I'm sure was also working very hard, but, um, you know, she had that added kind of expectation. Yeah. Yeah. That that makes perfect sense. And there there were some mentions in there, uh, definitely, that we see in the movie. One thing that you touched on there that I wanted to ask about is the, the time that, Marie does get kicked out of her lab, like we mentioned, but then Pierre offers her some space in his lab to work. And we start to actually see some of the work that Marie is doing. And she kind of explains to Pierre that when she measures uranium, she discovers less radiation than she does in the ore. In other words, she thinks that there might be an undiscovered element in there. And then that gets Pierre excited by this possibility. And he proposes a working partnership, offering her something that he had worked on. They call it a, a quadrant electrometer that he built to measure electrical charges in minimal, more precisely. It gets it, very scientific and way smarter than I ever could be. <laughs> um, but is, does the movie do a pretty good job of showing this, how they, how they worked, started working together in a partnership? I think the partnership was so foundational to their attraction to each other, to any element of their relationship that to kind of post-date it would be uh, maybe even to distort the kind of defining aspects of the relationship. Because um, one thing that that I write about in the in the book, at least, is um, how Pierre had actually like sworn off romance. He had an early heartbreak, and he he was so driven as a scientist, and he was really had kind of decided that romance would be a distraction, and there would be no room for romance in his life. And it was really only when he meets Marie that he says, "Oh wait, here is a woman who is my intellectual equal." Here is a woman who can actually support and help my, my scientific ambitions. And kind of in parallel to that with Marie, something that I learned actually after I had published the book, what, when I was contacted by a relative of that family for whom she was a governess during her teenage years oh, in wow. Poland. What, th- this is like, um, you know, a story that's never really been written about, but um that family, she was a governess to the smaller children, and they had an older son who was a math student, who when he came back from university, he and Maria Sklarowska fell in love. And the family looked down on her because she was working class, and they broke off the relationship. And that was another impetus for her to come to Paris. But uh, what I learned from his descendants was that they kept in touch their entire lives. And that even after she had become Madame Curie, the famous Nobel Prize winner, she still contacted him to talk about math problems and to discuss different equations. And so this kind of history and trajectory of intellectual partnerships is something that she had throughout her life from the time she was a teenager with Pierre and then, you know, in her relationship after Pierre. So I think for both of them, this was like a defining quality of what they sought in a partner. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I really get the impression that it was work first. And then that was, that was, you know, very heavily focused on that. And then obviously other, other things came afterwards, (laughs) but work work really seemed to be first. Um, Not to get too far ahead of the timeline, since we're, since we're talking about that, we do see 
later on in the movie that the relationship does change. And it just seems like, it seems like they're, they're talking and then they're, I think they're walking down the street and they just casually mention proposing and then take it back. Oh, we don't really know each other that well. And then we see them getting married. It just seems like it was a very rushed into marriage. Although it really does seem like they genuinely love each other. Does the movie do a good job of showing how that transition from a working partnership into something more and they were married? I think it happens somewhat differently in reality. <laughs> we, um, we do have a lot of letters back and forth between them and, and also uh, Marie's letters to her sister um, that time. And so we can see that he was really pursuing this idea of a relationship for quite some time. And she was resistant, but her resistance seems tied mainly to the idea that she was she had imagined she would return to Poland. Oh. And um, it's really when he finally says, I'll move to Poland for you, you know, that she's like, okay, he loves me. <laughs> I'm going to go for this. Um, so <laughs> I think, you know, when she writes to her sister, she says, you know, what can I do? You know, I, I hate to give up Poland. I'm paraphrasing. I hate to give up Poland, but we've become so attached to each other that we can't bear the idea of being apart. And, and they're married. So it's about a year after they meet that they're married. So I think it's a reasonable amount of time for like, you know, the late 1800s uh, courtship. So I think it's, it does, I think it's in reality, wasn't, wasn't rushed. Did they, do we know if then um, you mentioned she kind of wanted to go back to Poland? Was that always their plan with her, maybe even, even and her sister as well to go to France, but then eventually go back to Poland? Or maybe it was for that other guy that she kept writing to that she was a governess for or something? Do we know? I think that that relationship was really over by the time she was in Paris. But I think once she was like established at the Sorbonne and established, you know, and had to kind of built the relationship with Pierre, I think she knew that she was going to live in Paris. And then, you know, they started, they started a family. His family was close by, in particular, his father, they, they had a close relationship with his family. So uh, his brother was also a scientist. So I think she kind of built a life in, in France and was, she uses the word resigned, but I think she had kind of committed to, <laughs> to that life. <laughs> Work first and then yeah. she kind of resigns to a family. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess I mean resigned thinking. in the sense of, um, you know, of leaving her homeland. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it sounds like that wasn't when she left her homeland, that definitely wasn't her plan. A family wasn't what she had planned on. It sounds like, you know, she had played on, on work and then it, life happens sometimes and plans change. <laughs> Right, right. And we don't know. I mean, you know, she writes her, her diaries are, are very colorful and, and vivid. She says, you know, my, my mind is so alive with plants that it feels a flame. You know, again, I'm paraphrasing, but she, she really has a very um, passionate manner of, of expressing herself. So I think she may have been open to sort of an, all of the above when she moved. I don't know that she was confining herself to laboratory, you, you know, even in her imagination. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, <laughs> that's fascinating. You know, it, it, if we do go back to the movie, there's, um, it doesn't really go real deep into the technicalities of what the two are working on. Cause it is more focused on the people, I think, than, than the science in a lot of cases, but there is an explanation that Marie and Pierre have, they're having dinner with, uh, one of the scientists in their lab, Paul and his wife, Jean. And as it explains in the movie, they say that they take pitch blend ore, they crush it down, they boil it, they add acidic and alkaline solutions to remove all the substances until only that which is pure remains. And I think uh, she asks, sorry, Paul's wife asked Marie, why, why are you even looking at uranium? And she mentions the name Becquerel. Then later we find out that it takes around like four tons, like an, a, a lot of pitch blend to extract a very tiny pinprick of this new element that they discovered, radium. And then they mention another new element, polonium. and Marie points out that even they, they thought atoms were finite and stable, they aren't. And some of them emit rays and their instability happens. And then that's something she decided to call radioactivity. So I, I know there's a lot more science in there. We don't have to get into all <laughs> the scientific aspect of it, but just that general explanation of how the movie explains how they discovered radium and, and polonium. Is that a pretty good explanation of how, as Marie calls it in the movie, radioactivity, she came up with that was discovered? Yeah, it is. I mean, I think what basically, as you mentioned, 
Becquerel had no, he was a scientist who was working at the National History Museum there and he was working with uranium. He left his, you know, samples of uranium on a photographic plate overnight in a closed drawer. And when he returned, the photographic plate had the appearance of having been exposed to brilliant light. And he was like, oh, that's curious. There was no light. And so he publishes that, but he doesn't really pursue it. So what Marie decides to do is test basically every rock she can find to see if she can reproduce these findings. And so Such she does. Task, every she rock. just <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So like she just tests gazillions of different sample specimens. And one of these specimens is what you call, you know, which blend, which is the waste product of mining. The in this case was from these ceramic mines in Bohemia, Southern Bohemia. This is where she sees that result, you know, go this ineffable, something strange is happening here. And so, as you say, they, there was pitch blend was seen as a waste product. It wasn't seen to have any value. So they just imported these 400 tons of, you know, rubble and, and you mentioned earlier, like, you know, what were some of the obstacles she faced as a woman? It, you know, I've heard some scholars say that she took on this kind of physical task, like the backbreaking work of pulverizing by hand this, you know, these mountains of rubble, in part to prove that she's a woman, she can do this. She can do the hardest, most physical, most demanding part of this labor that took four years and that was, you know, so, so grueling. So yes, it, it gets to that other that other point. But I think that yeah, basically she just over, over time and with all this backbreaking labor, they, they distill down into these tiny, you know, tenth of a gram of radium. And radium, of course, is that's a name that they coined together based on the Latin word for rays. And polonium is named for Poland, for her homeland. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, I don't even think they mentioned that that part in the movie for that. <laughs> I mean, that, that's fascinating that uh, going through all these different rocks and then it they ended up going with something that was a waste product. It's almost like, okay, we, we, we literally went through all the rocks. Now we, what's next? Waste product. <laughs> That's, yeah. I'm sure it wasn't like that, but. That, <laughs> well, I think it makes sense, right? Because it was like the proportion of the radioactive matter was so tiny. It, like that it didn't exist on, in like a kind of um, concentrated form independent of these other kind of matrix. Wow. Yeah. That's, I mean, yeah. just, it, it's hard for, my mind is small, but it's hard for me to wrap around my, my round, <laughs> mind around the amount of material that it takes to make something so tiny. And then just the mere fact that they could find that like yeah. in the entire world and they can find that from it. it yeah, it's, it's mind boggling. <laughs> exactly. And I think the thing that fascinates me is the leap of imagination it took to to say, I think we're going to find this and we're going to spend the next four years determining if we're right or not. Yeah. And it's, a, I mean, there's, it's not, there's no GPS like, okay, this is yeah. the path we take to get there. Right. You exactly. spend four years, you know, you know, if, if you're going the right direction or not. Right. And you think about all the times that scientists are probably wrong, but you have to do that work to do to, for the times that you're going to be right. Uh, the, in the movie, the scientific community does, does seem to embrace this discovery right away. And then in 1903, Marie and Pierre win the Nobel Prize for it. And although, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Pierre had to insist that Marie's name was added to the Nobel. I know a lot of times movies kind of compress timelines, change timelines around. Is that a pretty accurate um, depiction of what happened in that timeline? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, I think it was it was undeniable, the significance of, of this discovery. And, you know, it's like something that, that was part of the series of discoveries, right? You, you see the history with Becquerel, you see William Ronchin making the x-ray. So you see this kind of community of scientists who are building on each other's work. And, and so I think it's immediately recognized the significance of what the Curies have achieved. And um, yeah, there's, there's no downplaying it. I guess it kind of goes back to what we were talking about. I mean, you know, it can, it's not going to be just one person necessarily that does everything. They're building on other discoveries and things like that and kind of building on until somebody actually finds it. <laughs> uh, in the movie, um, after they win the Nobel Prize, it seems like more than just the scientific community embraces the discovery of radium. We, we see things like radioactive cigarettes, radioactive toothpaste, there's beauty powder. They use radium as a cure for baldness. Uh, there's even a, a, a dermatologist, um, Henri Danlos. He, in the movie, he 
mentioned something about a significant shrinkage in the cancer tumor. And he was excited by this possibility of radium being a cure for cancer. I think it's a letter that was mentioned. I don't think he's actually uh, portraying in the movie seeing that. But I got the impression that there's, after this discovery, people thought radium was this cure-all. Everything from baldness to cancer, it's a beauty powder, it's toothpaste. Was Is there any truth to that, that people just thought that it was this magical cure-all for almost everything? Yes. that that And I think every product, all the packaging design that they show on screen, I think those are all real. Oh, those wow. Are, that, <laughs> I mean, you, I, I remember in my book, like I couldn't eat, narrowing down that list was such a fun challenge because it's such a colorful list of products. I mean, literally they're radium condoms, radium suppositories, <laughs> radium chocolates. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And the number of diseases it was said to cure is um, basically anything that you've ever heard of is included. And um, it's interesting though, in terms of the kind of leap of thinking that is made about radi- radium addressing cancer, Pierre actually took a tiny vial of radium and placed it on his arm. This is depicted, it kind of hinted at, along with the uh, other story you mentioned in the movie, he gets this kind of um, lesion on his arm from the radium. And they make the inference that if radium can kill disease tissue, excuse me, kill healthy tissue, perhaps it could also kill disease tissue. And they, the curies start doing experiments on animals to see if, um, and it's out of those experiments that they start doing the curie therapy or the, the radium treatment for cancer. Oh, wow. Which is oh, still wow. called curie therapy in French. Oh, wow. So, so there was, uh, I mean, at least for the for the cancer side, did they do anything with, with any of the other stuff? Or was that pretty much just marketers trying to, um, well, I guess I should say, were the Curies involved in any of the scientific side of any of these other products? We don't see any of that in the movie necessarily. It just seems, I got the impression it was, oh, this new thing, we can make some money off of it. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, I bet the vast majority of those products had no radium in them. I mean, <laughs> radium probably- was so difficult to get at that point. I mean, it was is insanely costly. And I mean, you know, what we just talked about, right? It took four years to get a 10th of a gram. Like this is not something that's just, you know, in every product that, you know, a face cream that you could, that you could buy. But, um, but it was definitely marketed that way. And I think sometimes I'm, I'm conscious of it because I see like the, the latest, you know, scientific kind of veneer that's applied to whatever makeup products or whatever. And I think this is a human inclination, right? We always want the the magic cure. That's exactly what I was thinking as I was watching the movie. I was like, okay, we know now, obviously, <laughs> these are not good things. You don't want radio mean everything. Yeah. But it kind of makes me think, well, what what is out there now that is seen as like this magic cure-all and, uh, you know, that we won't know about until you know, much later? Right. And like radium, as it turns out, like when, when it did become, you know, sufficiently mass produced to be able to be in various products, right? You have the radium watch girls, right? So they're to radium was used as a kind of glow in the dark material, particularly during World War One for, for dials that were used at night. And you had these women in New Jersey using very, very fine brushes, which they licked to get a fine point. And then they were painting the watch dials. So the faces of the watches would glow at night. And some of those girls were glowing from the waist up because they ingested so much radium. And of course, wow. the the company actually had a secret, what they called a doom book, which was the list of fatalities of, of the women who were working in the factory. Oh, wow. So not only that, but they were like covering up what was actually happening when they started to realize what was going on. Exactly, which resulted in the first class action lawsuit. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that, wow. Yeah, of course, none of that's none of that's shown right. in the movie. That's but yeah, a that's, tangent. Yeah. yeah, no, no, that, no, that's fa- that's fascinating. That's fascinating too. I mean, because it radium is dangerous. But yeah, I didn't even yeah. think about the fact, you know, during in the movie that what the process we just talked about it took so much to get that. That yeah, there probably really wasn't anything in there. But by the time it was, then it would make sense that they already had these products that would be marketed as a cure all. They're like, oh, now that we can actually mass produce this stuff better, let's actually try it. Maybe it is a cure all. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> Well, sp- speaking of some the tragedies there, there is a tragedy that we see in the movie and it happens while Pierre is, is walking through the street one rainy night. Uh, he's been coughing a lot leading up to this scene, but no one has really connected it to their work yet. 
and he's walking along. It's kind of a rainy night. He kind of has this really bad coughing fit, so much so he's so violent that he kind of stumbles into the street and then he's hit by a horse-drawn carriage and killed. How well did the movie do showing how Pierre Curie died? I mean, that's the gist of it. You know, he was he was walking in Paris on this drizzly night and was hit. I mean, we don't, you know, the precise cause. Was it linked to, you know, the weakness caused by exposure to radioactivity? That's that's more speculative. But but the gist, that's the gist. That's how he was killed. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, speculative, it seems like a fair conclusion, at least for a movie where it doesn't have to be entirely yeah. accurate. Yeah. Yeah. And that's definitely something that I, I talk about in the book as well. Yeah. The possibility of that connection. With that connection, because we see um, Pierre coughing a lot, but then we also see Marie coughing a lot even after Pierre's death. And obviously they're exposed at work. You know, they're working with what we now know are very dangerous elements. But in the movie, we even see them like sleeping with vials of radium at home. They seem to be just consistently exposing themselves to these elements, both not only at work, but also at home. Is that really true that they did that at home as well? Yeah, apparently. I mean, they were so entranced. It was, I mean, can you imagine this is this absolutely beautiful kind of magical substance. Marie described being in the lab at night as being surrounded by fairy lights. Mm. And so she did. She apparently kept a small a small vial by her bedside. And it, it's really interesting because this is a moment in history when electric lighting was becoming the norm. And apparently electric lighting of this period was so harsh, was so brilliant and so white. And I think so alarming to many people who had grown up and lived with candlelight and that kind of softness and gentleness of candlelight. And so when radium began to, you know, make its appearance on the scene, some people thought, oh, maybe this is the solution to our lighting problem. We can avoid this, the horrors of electric light and actually <laughs> paint our rooms with radium. And <laughs> so that was, that was speculated for a while. And if it falls off, it'll cure our baldness too. <laughs> it's perfect. It's a, exactly. There was something marketed called undark paint, which was made with radium. Oh, wow. Oh, I mean, yeah. almost like we have yeah. black light today, right? I mean, it kind of that, right. that glowy effect. So we're still trying to get it yeah. in a safer way. Yeah. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> wow. That's, I mean, that's, that's fascinating. That, and it, I mean, it, it, it almost makes sense. I mean, I didn't even think about that because you do see it's, you know, it's glowing and it's, it's different. I didn't even think about, you know, the fact that electric lighting was, would not have been as common for, you know, most people, not that most people would have had radium either, but, you know, just, you know, this idea of it being something brand new and it's, it is magical looking. I mean, it is. Definitely. Back in the movie, we see um, after Pierre passes away, we see Marie and Paul start having an affair. Obviously, Paul's wife doesn't like this. She releases some rather private letters between Marie and Paul into the newspapers and then we start, we start to see people protesting outside Marie's home. They, they call her some terrible names. They, they demand that she goes back to Poland, you know, go back home. Um, yeah. Around the same time, there are some reports of radiation starting to cause illnesses. We don't really know the full extent of it yet. The people don't know the full extent, but the general opinion of radium kind of seems to be changing here. And so the impression that I got was that this public perception of Marie drastically changed, you know, almost like this roller coaster, you know, after, after Pierre's death, where there's this affair that's being made public in the papers. And then there's people that are starting to link some health complications to radiation. Is the movie correct to suggest that these were reasons why this public perception of Marie Curie changed? Um, I never read the linkage in that way. Um, I think the reaction to her relationship with Paul Langevin was extraordinarily negative and she was characterized in all the ways you described with a lot of xenophobia. This came on the heels of the Dreyfus affair. Even though she wasn't Jewish, she was called all kinds of anti-Semitic things and characterized that way. But I don't know that the scholarship supports a connection with the dangers of radiation playing into that. Okay. So those were two separate yeah. things that, yeah. okay. okay. I think thematically, you know, there, you had to have that twist in the story works for the movie, but I don't, I don't know that the historical record supports that. Sure. Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, I mean in a, yeah, in a movie, you're going to have this, you know, this, this climax there that, that happens with that. Right. Uh, 
were there actually protests and things like that? I mean, the movie seems to imply that it wasn't just something that was something that she was reading about, but like, I mean, it seemed like there were like there were people with signs picketing, you know, outside her home. Like it just seemed like a constant thing. It just had to have in the movie, in the movie, she seems to try to not let it bother her, but I, I don't know how you could not let it bother you. Was there any truth to that, yeah. that kind of thing? I think it definitely bothered her. She did leave Paris and she traveled under an assumed name. Oh, and then okay. and she actually went to England and stayed with a mathematician friend of hers. And so, yeah, she she basically got out of Dodge. Um, I think it was quite uncomfortable. It was a real international scandal. And then I think the the turning point for her came when World War II started and people were sufficiently distracted to not engage in the, those kind of petty, petty gossipy stories anymore. And because she was so heroic in World War One, excuse me, did I say World War Two? I meant World War One. Yeah, um, yeah, I, yeah. No, I, I okay. know which made me World War One. Yeah, <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, right. So when the war started, that that changed the conversation. But but it, it was deeply uncomfortable for her. Yeah. At the time. Okay. It did, so did it affect her? I mean, it had to have affected her work then at that point too. Was did that change a lot? Yeah, well, it was. I, there was a confluence of events in this kind of extraordinary and unprecedented way, which was, you know, she was the first woman to have won a Nobel Prize. And then in 2000, 2011, 1911, <laughs> <laughs> I'm really scrambled here. In 1911, she's awarded a second Nobel Prize. So no one has won two Nobel Prizes at this point in history. And certainly a woman to win two different two Nobel Prizes in two different sciences. She won physics and chemistry. So here she is, like one of history's most celebrated scientists. And just at that moment is when the scandal breaks. And so the Swedish Academy actually writes to her and says, you know, maybe it's better if you don't come. Maybe you should just turn down this prize and spare us all the embarrassment. And of all people, she's supported by Albert Einstein, among others. But, you know, some people kind of step to her defense. And, and she again, to her credit, is stoic. And she says, you know, this is nonsense. My work is being recognized and my private life has nothing to do with the value of my work. And I'll be in Sweden to accept that Nobel Prize. Thank you very much. <laughs> good on her. I mean, good on her. It, it, it yeah. sounds almost, uh, what you're saying there almost sounds very similar to a line that we saw earlier in the movie. Um, even, well, I guess it would, and actually, no, I think I'm getting my timelines messed up. I think it was actually after, after Pierre um, passed away, they offered her his position at the university and in the movie she has a line of something where like my work speaks more for for itself you know i'm not here to try to prove to you anything my work speaks for itself and she just kind of left it at that see so she knew she knew how smart she was she knew that she what she had accomplished yeah i think that's a really bittersweet moment right she becomes the first woman professor in the his the 650 year history of the sorbonne but it's only because her husband died was she trying to become a, a, a professor or was, I mean, I, I know it happened because her husband, husband died, but um, I mean, she could have, obviously, if she, if she wanted to, she was definitely smart enough. I mean, do you think she was actually, was that something she wanted to do or was it purely because of her husband passing? I mean, I, I don't specifically remember reading anything about her per pursuing that ambition. Mm. So I can't speak to that specifically. I imagine that, um, you know, if she had been a man, it would have been automatic. So it may have been something that she chose not to focus on because she didn't think that it was going to happen. But, and I, I mean, I think her research life was extremely full and fulfilling. <laughs> so I don't know that she, that there, it felt like there was a missing piece that she was like actively pursuing, but I think it's like, a, you know, that's a natural part of of intellectual life and scientific research. So I guess, she, I, I guess she, I don't know. It's my, yeah. my short no, answer is I don't that's know. That's fair. And I mean, and she, uh, she had enough on her plate. <laughs> I mean, yeah. We were talking about all, especially all the manual labor and everything on that too, that the stuff that we yeah. don't see in the movie, uh, you know, the, the behind the scenes stuff, the actual, you know, heavy, heavy work, the manual labor and everything. Yeah. I'd yeah. say she had enough on her plate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about Marie and Pierre's two daughters, but near the end of the movie, we see uh, the older of them. I would pronounce it Irene, but in the movie, they pronounce it Irene. They convince, she convinces her mother to take up a new fight. As you mentioned, with World War I, it's raging and, and soldiers are just having their limbs amputated for things as simple as a sprained ankle, according to the movie. 
And then Marie takes up this new cause and she uses her connections. Even She even offers to melt down her Nobel Prizes for the gold to help fund the x-ray machines and ambulances that she needs to save lives. And then we see in the movie, the mother-daughter team working together. They're working in, in mobile radiography units on the battlefields. And there's text at the very end of the movie that says, over a million men were x-rayed by the units, saving countless lives. Is it true that her daughter was the one to convince Marie to find a way to use her influencing scientific connections and all that and her science itself to save lives during World War I? I don't believe it was Iren who had that idea. I think it was Marie. Um, they did work together. And Iren, you know, who was just a teenager and she was, you know, out there on the battlefield and trained as a x-ray technician and she was doing that work for sure. But I think... I don't believe there's any sourcing for her having the initial idea. Okay. So that a little, little bit of creative yeah. license there, but how about yeah. the, the effectiveness of that was, was, I guess the, the concept of it with the movie we write say like, okay, they're amputating the, one of the extreme examples I think they gave in the movie was, you know, a sprained ankle. And so they cut off the leg. Was that something that was real that was happening that her units were able to help with? Um, the sprained ankle idea, I'm not sure. They were definitely, it, so basically the idea was that you have soldiers getting injured in the battlefield and by the time that they could be transported far away to a hospital, they could have lost so much blood or so much time that the, those injuries would become fatalities. Um, whereas if you could bring a mobile x-ray unit bring the medical care to the soldiers on the battlefield, they could get that care that much faster. And so you would avoid, for instance, if a bullet was lodged in a soldier's leg, but it wouldn't be visible on the surface, you would, instead of having like some wild exploratory, exploratory surgery where the doctor is basically working blind, you take an x-ray, you see exactly where that bullet is and you pull it out and you don't have to, as you say, amputate the leg. So sprained ankle, I'm not sure. <laughs> that seems a little drastic because I would think, you know, you're not going to mistake a sprained ankle for an invasive injury like a bullet, but they definitely use those mobile x-ray units extremely effectively to, um, you know, for, for much better targeted treatment. Yeah, that makes sense. And and the, the distance was something I didn't think about too, because yeah, by the time they get to the hospital, you know, if they don't, if they can't get the bullet out for, you know, digging around blind, then yeah, it could lead to much, a much worse infection. And then you right. might have to amputate at that point. I, I mentioned some of the kind of the impressions that I got while I was watching the movie. But one thing about movies is everybody can walk out of the movie with a completely different impression of the exact same movie. And movie adaptations, they always change things from the book. but let's say someone's listening to this and they've only seen the movie. And that's all that they know about Marie Curie's life. What's something that you really wish they would walk away from the movie knowing about Marie Curie's life and about the true history that came through in the story? Yeah. I mean, I think some of her innovations speak to her ability to kind of take you know, to step back and to use her imagination to make leaps, intellectual leaps, and to, which allowed her to make discoveries. Um, for instance, so we've talked about her laboratory research. We've talked about her work in the battlefield. That's actually pretty unusual for the period that someone would be doing this, what's called, you know, what might be called pure science in the lab. But then thinking about how it could be applied, thinking about what real world implications it has. And one of the things that the Curies did was put their, situate their lab when they, you know, later on in their life and they could build their own lab right next to a hospital and collaborate with medical doctors. So that was really innovative for the time. And another thing they did was um, not see their science removed from the world in terms of ethics. And you see that a little bit in the movie with the quotes when Pierre makes his Nobel speech in 1903, and he talks about the potential implications for weaponry, which of course, you know, we see nuclear weapons. So I think, and, and another thing we can talk about with Marie in World War I is that she was really instrumental in setting up the League of Nations, which was a forerunner to the United Nations. And she, they, the Curies were pacifists, and they saw the potential of how their discoveries could be used. And they 
wanted to work for peace. And like it was implied when we talked about the products, they didn't patent radium. They didn't seek to profit from radium. They saw their discoveries as a universal good. And so I think that the way that they straddle the world of research and and not separating the world of science, medicine, and ethics is really something quite beautiful. Um, and I think the one of the things that drew me to the subject to write this book in the first place was the kind of duality that we see in each of these instances, the potential for good and the potential for harm, right? We see it with the cancer treatments. We see that radiation can cause cancer. It can cure cancer. We see that radium can be used for so much good for nuclear energy in ways that can spare us fossil fuel contamination, but it can also cause nuclear catastrophe. It can be used, you know, in ways that advance civilization and also be used to destroy civilization, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and all of these other kind of looming <laughs> catastrophic uses of nuclear warfare. So I think that duality is really, really fascinating and that tension. And I think the Curie's story and their love story embodies this in in a really compelling way. That's yeah, that's fascinating. I love how you said that with the the contrast between the two. And you mentioned your book. You have a fantastic book. It's called Radioactive Marie and Pierre Curie, A Tale of Love and Fallout. And I have to say I I love it's not a typical history book. Right. It, it's not, you know, think of a history book that's black and white text on a, you know, on, on just paper, but it's a it's it, like, it's colorful. It's a colorful combination of history and art. So before I let you go, can you share something about the Curies that maybe surprised you while you were researching and writing your book, as well as where someone who wants to learn more about the true story can get their own copy of it? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think I've touched on some of the kind of things I've discovered, like, you know, Marie's early romance and Oh, one thing that's really, really fascinating is that I was fortunate enough to interview the Curie's granddaughter, the daughter of Irene and at Helene Julio Curie. And in fact, Helene is married to the grandson of Paul Langevin, Charles Langevin. And so this kind of third generation and it's um it's just another thing we didn't even touch on is that Irene and her husband, Frederick Julio, also won the Nobel Prize because for their um, work on artificial radioactivity. And so actually Helen was just extraordinary when I interviewed her, I think because basically everyone in her family has won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so no she pressure. because she even though she's this incredibly accomplished physicist, she was like you know, well, some people only do small things. Some people do big things and some people only do small things. So I was like, that's your standard. You have to win the Nobel Prize to be, you know, like this. But it, <laughs> she's just extraordinary. And um, yeah, so so this legacy continues. Wow, that's, yeah, that's fascinating. I, I, yeah, that, <laughs> no pressure there, <laughs> winning the prize. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again so much for your time to come on to chat about Radioactive. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. I'd like to thank Lauren Redness once again for sharing her knowledge about the true story behind Radioactive. If you want to learn more about the true story, as I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, Lauren's book is what the movie was based on. And it's both an amazing history book, but also visually, it's just beautiful. And if you're watching the video version of this, you can kind of see just how visual this is and how it's more than just a, you know, your average history textbook. It's a beautiful mix of art and history. I love it. You're going to love it too. It's called Radioactive, Marie and Pierre Curie, A Tale of Love and Fallout. And you can find a link to it in the show notes for this episode, as well as on the show's home on the web, based on a true story podcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. And as a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, Pierre made it clear that Marie's work should be recognized by the Nobel Prize Committee. Number two, radium was marketed in everything from toothpaste to cures for baldness. Number three, 
Marie immediately knew how dangerous it was, so she didn't actually keep any radium at home. Did you catch which one is a lie? Let's, we're going to go in a random order this time. We're going to start with number two. Radium was marketed in everything from toothpaste to cures for baldness. That is true. After it was discovered, while Pierre and Marie Curie didn't try to patent and make a ton of money off their discovery, there were plenty of other people who did things like we see in the movie. They were trying to make a ton of money off radium. They made radium toothpaste and cures for baldness. All these things hit the market. Although, as Lauren pointed out, because it took so much work to produce such a small amount of radium, it probably wouldn't have been cost effective to actually have radium in all those things. Next up is number three. Marie immediately knew how dangerous it was, so she didn't actually keep any radium at home. That's the lie. As we learned from Lauren, the movie was correct to show that Marie kept some radium on her nightstand at home. No one knew how dangerous it was right away. That means number one is also true. Pierre made it clear that Marie's work should be recognized by the Nobel Prize Committee. At first, Marie wasn't included in the nomination for the Nobel Prize in Physics, but Pierre made it clear that any Nobel Prize in research for radioactivity needed to include Marie. If you get value out of Based on a True Story, you can give back whatever you feel it's worth, whether it's a dollar, $10, $100, <laughs> whatever value you get out of the show, you can give back and learn how to get ad-free versions of the show over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Until next time, thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon. 